and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Welcome to the show, everyone. This is the Journey Radio Show, and hey, we're the She Squatchers. I'm Jen Cruz, your host, and I've got my trusty teammates on the line. I've got Tammy Tricol. Hey, Tammy. Hi, everybody. And Jenna Grover. Oui, bonjour. That was French for hello, if you don't know. Yes, <laughs> yes. Teasing. She can be bilingual at times. Maybe it's just a word or two, but hey, it hey. still counts. Thank you, Jen, for acknowledging it. You're welcome. We have an exciting guest for you tonight. Um, I'm excited to get to know him a little bit better because we're going to actually be meeting him in person next month at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference. Uh, So he is a fellow speaker at the conference. I can't wait to meet him, but let's get to know him tonight a little bit. It's Scott Barda, everybody. Yay. Scott, are you there? I am. (laughs) It's a pleasure being here, ladies. Yes. Thank you for coming on and, and dancing into the show with us. Those on the on the live radio, they don't get to see us doing our little dances, and we encourage people to dance in. <laughs> I, I did loved my your bob- best. I loved your little bobblehead. That Thank was cute. you. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. So Scott, you know, we're just gonna take the listeners through your journey of how did you get into the whole idea of Bigfoot? Have you always been a believer? Uh, no, not at all. Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Kansas and I lived in Colorado after college from 1986 to 91. And Mike Johnson, uh, my best friend since 1967, which ironically is the same year as the Patterson Gimlin film. Uh, it, I met him in 1967 in Salina, Kansas. And he moved out to Colorado in 1977. After college, I moved out to uh colorado in 1986 and was there till 91. we camped a lot in the woods uh even when i would go visit him in 1977 and and through the years before i moved out there we spent a lot of time with his family and he's he's a mountain man um so we never had any kind of proclivity towards uh the paranormal or towards Bigfoot, uh, Sasquatch is what I usually refer to. Um, so no, I literally had no, uh, idea or entertained any thought about it, uh, until, uh, in 2003, we had a family, our families got together in Fairplay, Colorado. And after, a like s'mores and campsite stuff the kids all went inside and mike asked me do you believe in bigfoot and i said no and he had kind of mentioned it before and i'd said you know you know how i feel about this i'm just not real receptive to it and he said they're real and then he proceeded to tell me his experiences that he had and where he had them and I will tell you this much. I've known him a long time and I knew he was serious and he was very nervous about telling me this. So, uh, that was in 2003 In 2006, he took me to the place where he saw a Sasquatch. Um, and again, I, I really kind of took it on a lark. I went with him cause he asked me to, and, uh, it was outside of Colorado Springs. That's, best I can tell you on locations because we're really close lipped on everything because it seems like every time we say something th- something gets shut down and areas no longer become available and it's just happened so many times that and we have a website sasquatch investigations of the rockies.org 
and we can see who comes and visits and it's all over the place. And so we just took a different, we, we used to take anybody who would ask to go just to go. And then we found out that that was not a good idea. And, uh, so, uh, in 2009, yeah. So in 2006, we went to where he went or where he saw this. I didn't see anything really. We did find some hairs. We collected them, sent them in. We never heard anything back. We didn't pay any money for it to happen. So, uh, it just, nothing ever came of it. They told us the hairs were inconclusive, um, which seems to be the go-to answer. And so then in 2009, he had gone out with the uh, BFRO and, as a guest and joined them for a, a little while. And he met another guy uh, that actually lived right around the block from him. And uh, so in 2009, he said, you got to come out to where I mean, lots of stuff happened. So I went out there and I went from a zero believer zero experiences to becoming a Sasquatch Investigations of the Rockies co-founder. I mean, it happened that fast. And uh, Mike and I both, for our professions, have 50 years of uh, insurance adjusting experience. We don't sell it. We service the policy. So we're investigators. And in order to do this successfully, you have to, you have to, every file you work better be ready to go to court and be scrutinized. So we both did this for 50 years. Him, him a lot longer than me. He did it up until last year. I did it for 22 years. Um, so we're investigators by nature. And um, there's just so many things that happened on that trip that I just, it, it blew my mind and things just became I was scared. I mean, at that point, we were all pretty much terrified to leave the tent at night when the sun went down. Um, you just, if you had to go to the restroom, you just didn't do it. You just waited till the sun came up. Um, and I, that, those first few days, every time I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be like, I'm alive, you know, because you, uh, we heard so many things and you'd hear bipedal things running around and you'd hear, uh, vocalizations. And I just couldn't believe it, to be quite honest with you, because I, I went out there to kind of prove that he was uh, delusional. And instead, you know, I came away with a completely different mindset and it's never gone back to its original dimensions again. <laughs> and it's gotten freakier and crazier since then. So that's kind of how it all got started. So, I mean, what happened that made you so afraid to get out of the tent? Did something specific happen? What, and well, it was the it was the noise and the you you hear the whoops and you heard uh, you heard the running around of, of the of the and then see then we were and we also had started a feeding station and we call it the meat pit. And th these guys did this before I got out there. But this was only, I think, when I got out there, was only the third time that any of us had gone to the spot. But they had established feeding them uh, or feeding something. And so I would, we'd go down there and we'd do our little ritual and we'd leave the, the liver, uh, the bloody liver on a plate, a paper plate on a log. And then we would, do some things that I can't really discuss. They're like Pavlovian things, you know, uh, little tricks that we do. And uh, I didn't initiate them. I just observed. And we'd go back down there after all this action around our tent and, uh, and the meat would be gone and the plate would still be sitting on the log. And most of your things that are going to eat that are going to tear the plate up and, uh, and then we found prints, I actually a castable print that was 12 and a half inches. I found 
little did I know, 12 years later, it's the only one that I'd ever found that was castable. And unfortunately, the guy who casted it gave it to his grandson, and his grandson, grandson broke it. And uh, so, you know, what can I say? I, I learned a lesson there because I've never had one since then that you could cast. Um, some of the other people in our group have had some luck casting them. But uh, uh, that first night that I was there, though, uh, about four in the morning, and I, and the first thing that I did was I looked at the back at the outfitter's tent and the moon was hitting it and so it was very white and uh, I said to him I go gosh if anything steps in front of this it's gonna make a shadow and so at about four in the morning I, I woke up for no reason and I looked and there was this huge uh, shadow that was on the back of the tent and I just stared at it for about 15 minutes, and I and honestly, I didn't have any fear about that. I felt very calm, um, even though we'd had stuff going on a little bit. It was the very first night, and I just kind of dismissed it as a shadow of a tree and never woke anybody up, never said a word. There was other people in there. I could, If, if, if it would have been me now, I would have been like, we've got to be all over this. You know, we'll either come out of the tent. Because now uh, we've kind of all turned off our fear button. And so now we'll go out of the tent and do kinds of things that, uh, that initially we would never dream of doing. Because none of us uh, had any experience in this. So everything that was happening was very shocking to your system when you're a non-believer. And uh, Mike was not a non-believer because he'd seen the Sasquatch in in the night in the mid 90s i believe but me i was a zero believer so but that very first night i think about that often if it if even if it had been two or three days later i would have woke people up and i would have said we've got to watch this and see what happens and see if it moves or go outside and go around and see what's doing it because the next morning I went out there and I found some mashed down grass and, and what I thought looked like uh, kind of an indiscernible print that was about 17 inches. And and then Mike was like, I think he's probably saw a darn Sasquatch. And I was like, I don't know. And he goes, well, watch the tent, or watch the side of the tent for the next four or five days that we're there. And sure enough, I did. And the sky was the same. The moon was the same. And there was never a shadow, not one shadow on the back of that tent uh, that, again, so um, it, it, it was a missed opportunity, but it happened too quickly. Well, that's really, that's really cool. I had a shadow at my tent uh, a couple of years ago, but it was a big 750 pound bear sniffing at my door. And I saw the shadow and I'm like, Oh my God, it's a bear. <laughs> oh, yeah. What we've found is that we've, we've seen uh, mountain lion prints. We've seen uh, really honestly, we've only seen a couple of bears. Uh, uh, they, it seems like it, that all your apex predators in our area, they don't, they may cross through, but they don't stick around. They just keep moving. And uh, which we find interesting too. And uh, one time we had that same trip, uh, we had a park ranger, a park ranger that had his day off and he had two dogs with him that, and he came down the road and um, his dogs got out and they were all happy. And then they like got within about 15 feet of our campsite and just their whole demeanor changed. It just went south. And, uh, we did, you know, we just all kind of laughed when the guy left because we didn't say what we were doing. We, like I said, we we really don't tell people or advertise why we're in a particular area for a lot of reasons. Back then, it was just who wants to tell people that you're out looking for Sasquatch. But it's become in the 12 years since then, it's become such a common. Uh, the bar has changed so dramatically as to what people will accept as reasonable and what they want. And for me, the bar has 
is all over the place at this point. And that took 12 years to get there. I didn't jump on a bandwagon, uh, you know, that there was more than Sasquatch that I might be dealing with. It, it took me having to see, experience things on multiple occasions when other things were going on that we think are Sasquatch related for me to start thinking, um, my gosh, are these things related? Are they, are they one entity that has the ability to do several things or are they several entities that work together? And I know, you know, again, I'm not that comfortable speaking about all this stuff. I never have been. I don't think I ever will be just because the way I was raised uh, in Kansas, where I've never had any experiences, weirdness does not follow me around. It only happens when I go researching and I go looking. Um, that's when it happens. So it's pretty controlled for me. Um, I don't have things just always happening. I know people do. I'm, and, and I'm much more open-minded about all that. But for me, I really, truly have to experience things myself in order to uh, get wrapped up in it. And so that's why I don't talk about it a lot, especially being from Kansas. And when I do, um, I don't really take offense if people look at me kind of like I'm a flake. You know, I mean, I'm like, I've done it myself. So, you know, how can I judge somebody else for that behavior? So exactly. Well, of course, this gets me curious. You said you're not comfortable talking about those things, but are you comfortable telling us? Oh, yeah, I, I, I have to get comfortable. I, I have to get comfortable with it because I wrote the book. I've written two books, but the first book that I wrote in 2014. Is really kind of a catharsis for me that um, it, it would be the equivalent of uh it's kind of like this boy's life if you've ever seen the movie this boy's life with leonardo dicaprio um and then it goes into dazed and confused which was my high school years in kansas and then it's like office space because i talk about my work as an adjuster and it's kind of it's comical it's it's a much funnier book it's written in, with humor um and then the last part it very little of it deals with the Sasquatch part, maybe five chapters. So when I wrote this book, and that was called Last of the Baby Boomers, um, this book, I specifically wrote it laser focused on Sasquatch experiences, and it's called In the Dark Pine, and it's about the Sasquatch experiences that I've had. Um, and then it talks about a lot of resources as to why we can't wrap our why we can't get more definitive evidence and and how they're able to pop in and out and you only get one track here or there and you know people can't get other than the patterson gimlin film which a lot of people think you know have a whole litany of uh feelings about it that it's fake or it's not fake i believe it but um I've never seen a Sasquatch, and I want to make that crystal clear. I've seen things that initially, I th and I still think, probably were manifested by Sasquatches. It's eye shine, and I don't know if you're any of you are familiar with eye shine, but I was in this thing for three years before eye shine. Any of us saw eye shine, and eye shine in 2009 would have been the woo you know, which is really kind of your insulting term for anybody that w believes that everything is just flesh and blood, which is exactly when, when, I when I went from zero believer to starting to believe that I was dealing with something, it, we all thought it was primate. So we, we went from primate, flesh and blood, really felt like Mike and I would put our heads together as investigators and wrap this little mystery up and in a tight little bow very quickly we got uh stealth cams put it on the food put them on tr on areas where there'd be choke points where where you couldn't go anywhere else and they whited them out 
the whatever it was we were dealing with whited out our stealth cams. I, it happened like five times in the first week we were there. And then it happened numerous times after that. And and then so well, later wait, on. When you say that whited it out, the, is that something the, that you could reproduce if you tried? Oh, no, no. It, what, what it is is that we would set our camera, our stealth cameras out. And we would put them in these certain locations, like on the food. They would white out for 15 minutes. What they would because they take bursts of nine. So you would you would see that they were working, but then when at some point they would just go white or gray, and you would see nothing. Then they would come back when we'd come visit the next morning to check our stealth cams. It would show only us. But during that, during these periods of time, there, the, you know, we felt like after a while when it happened um, enough times on, a, on different outings, we realized that um, that's probably the indicator that we're actually capturing something, but we're sure as heck not going to get an image. And then battery problems, which you hear a lot about. We were having those to the point of making us crazy. And this was again in 2009. And now that's common knowledge that people have problems with their, uh, their equipment that tries to capture images. But back then, we didn't have anything to really um, compare to. So we were just... We had we had our computers and laptops out in the field so we could check things like our stealth cams and download the images right there and then. And it'd be like Christmas. We we go, oh, look, there's images, you know, and we we look at them and then go white it out, white it out again, grayed out. They would either be whited out or they'd be grayed out. And I have several examples of them in my book that I actually um, put in my book to show what they do. Um, but near, not nearly as many as, as we, my book would be filled with those if I put all of them in there. So I just took a selection of photos and in my book, I have over 110 photographs because I'm a guy who really likes visual stuff. And what I'm trying to do is give the reader an opportunity at least to see the lay of the land, uh, where we are, what I'm talking about, what it, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. So, so I used a lot of uh, pictures in my book. Um, and then we do have several pictures from investigators that we have that um, lead us to believe that there might be a spectrum. To me, it leads me to believe there's either a spectrum of Sasquatches and it's either that or or both I, at this point i'm of the opinion that until something gets solved really legitimately solved that i'm not taking anything off the table um and quite frankly i didn't add anything to the table until things happen and i saw it and then i'd be like okay that's something i can add you know when can i detract and uh and I'm not the only one. I've never camped by myself. I do make it perfectly clear that I speak for my, myself because when Mike and I started Sasquatch Investigations of the Rockies, we were having some weird things happen, but we, we did not want to go down that rabbit hole. We wanted to be taken serious by scientists and because we were in uh, communication with some of them and wanting to work with them. And we feel like scientists really need to be involved. Um, so we just said, we're not going to talk about the other stuff so that we can save our credibility. But what happened is those things continued to happen and then became even stranger so that um, we had to get to a point where I'll let Mike talk about what he believes or or I know what he believes, but I I, I, I let him speak for himself. I, I'm not gonna 
put words in other people's mouths. Uh, I'm not going to say that everybody believes what I believe, even though I can tell you that I've never been by myself when I've experienced the things. I drive, you know, I live in Kansas. I drive out to Colorado to have these experiences. So I'm not by myself driving all the way out there. How many hours do you drive? Oh, gosh, it's uh, 12 hours sometimes. Um, wow. It depends. Well, see, you get to the front range, and some of our locations are two or three hours up in the mountains or 45 minutes into the mountain. And we have locations two and 300 miles apart, and we have the same. That's the beauty of this is that it's like a giant laboratory. And when you start seeing the same behaviors and same things happening in different locations 200 miles apart, you can start uh, saying, well, this is more than a coincidence. You know, my opinion is, is if something happens three or four times, it's probably not a coincidence. It's probably got some kind of, uh, it's got some kind of tie-in, if you will. So, I've been very lucky. I mean, sometimes I feel like I've, like I said, you know, I'm your best friend and what I'm giving you is a gift and a curse. And he's right. It has been because, you know, it's not my natural state to, to ever think that, that, that I would be this guy. And a lot of my friends can't imagine that I'm this guy because I was never that guy, you know, and through childhood, adolescence, high school, college, and uh, starting my career. I was not that guy until 2009. I was 46 years old. So for 46 years, nothing. And from there till I, uh, now I'm 58, it's been it's been a wild ride, to say the least, and getting crazier all the time uh, with what we with what we think we are dealing with. But this woo thing, it's it's really it's really thrown around, uh, very insulting. I'll get it out of this, you know. I mean, there'll be people out there that'll slam you. So you have to have thick, you know, you ladies know, you have to have thick skin to do this. You have to be very confident in yourself and your image to put yourself out there on these things because you are going to you're going to take a, a hit from from people you don't know and people that you do know. Well, who would ridicule you for being on our show? I mean, we're we are wonderful ladies, so <laughs> I totally you agree. are so right, <laughs> and that, that's why I'm on your show. You know, I I thought to myself. Um, okay, I turned down a lot of stuff and somebody asked me, why are you doing this? When I said, I just think it would be very rude to not do this when I'm going to be speaking with these ladies at a conference and say no to them on a podcast. I just felt like that would, would, would send the wrong message, even though I think you'd probably understand it if we talked off air and I told you why I didn't want to do podcasts and why I don't put myself out there. But, but um, like I said, when you write a book and you go into great detail and you spend four years uh, writing the book and, in, and, and having things change so quickly in those four years, uh, you, you, you're going to have to talk about it. So, here I am. Exactly. And that's why I'll be at the Bigfoot Conference in Nebraska come April. I am so sad I won't be there, but um, I'm very jealous of Jen and Tammy for getting to meet you up close and personal next time, right? Absolutely. Good. It'd be my pleasure. Yeah, Mine too. Awesome. awesome. Well, we're getting up to our commercial break, so let's go to our commercial break and we'll be right back in two minutes. Stay tuned. Good job. All right. Are you less nervous? Because you're doing great. You are. 
I, am I allowed to talk? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you can talk. It's just going to be on the video. So. Oh, okay. I just didn't know whether I was supposed to be quiet for the commercial or not. Well, we we can. Uh, I'm watching the clock, so when it gets closer to our two minute warning, we'll have to be quiet. All right. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm le I'm less nervous. You guys are. Um, I always get less nervous once I start diving into it. Um, you know, it's not like I haven't done uh, other things. I was on the chasing big, so. Yeah. Well, I sure appreciate you coming on. So, and you're doing fabulous. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you having me and giving me the opportunity to tell my story at least. Yeah, let's get your book sold. Ooh, ooh. Boy, I, that would be great. Definitely. I, I'll, be honest with, I'll be honest with you. I didn't, you know, in, in the final analysis, I really wrote it to chronicle uh, what happened even long after I'm gone. Because uh, I don't really think that things are going to get solved while I'm in. Uh-oh. Those two are both frozen now. 30. <laughs> we'll take it over. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> Jen, where'd you, you go? Can get it, get it yeah, you can. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm gonna put it. Don't forget all of the uh, 